All right, we've been commemorating our 29th year of ministry here in the Maryland area. In August of 1990, God sovereignly positioned us in this area and led us to begin what we now call Bethel Well Irish Ministries International. And we thank God for all those that have been part of this journey, some from the very beginning. And each year, God has added more people. And uh, we want to thank God for all of you who at this point in time are part of this wonderful thing God is doing in the world. Amen? Pastor Chris and I are honored that God allows us to be part of something he's doing. And we are tremendously honored that God has blessed us to be your pastors and to give us such wonderful people with whom we can do ministry together. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. We thank God for this heavenly vision because that's what it is. And we thank God for his enablement because nothing you see here or nothing that is happening around the world is happening because Bishop Johnson and Pastor Chris are these great people. They're happening because we believe in a great God. Amen. Amen. And that great God has chosen weak, weak vessels to work through so that all the glory can go to him. So raise two hands and give him all the glory. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Amen. And so we started on Wednesday night and uh, we had uh, Dr. Sean Smith with us. And you know what? I want, to, I want to, to praise God for the people that showed up on Wednesday. We had a full house in, in our covenant hall. Um, and, and what blessed me was they weren't coming because they were looking for a prophecy. They weren't coming so someone can tell them their name and uh, about the enemies and the witches in the village. And, uh, no, no. They were coming because they were, they came because they were hungry for the word. Ooh. Amen. Some people are finally getting it that the, the, the most powerful prophetic word, the word that can change your life and your destiny forever is the word of the gospel. Hallelujah. And when we hear and we understand and we believe this gospel, it is the power of God that produces salvation. And salvation means wholeness. May your hunger and your thirst and your desire for the word continue to increase. May you never be satisfied. Amen. May you always be saying, Lord, continue to unfold to me the mysteries of the gospel. Amen. Amen. So I was blessed to see that so many of our people are learning to prioritize the word over everything else. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And it was good to know that, you know, Dr. Sean Smith reaffirmed the things we've been teaching you. Um, but it also became very clear to me that even though we've been teaching you, not everybody has been listening as well because for too many of you, it sounded like it was new. So we got to do a better job in reminding you and you got to do a better job at listening. But we thank God for, for his ministry was powerful and, and to God be the glory. And then Thursday night, we had another powerful man of God come all the way from Cameroon. So Cameroon was in the house, <laughs> our own. God was, stand up, professor. <laughs> I'm, I'm calling uh, Reverend Galong, professor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Because he ministers, taught the word, and gave us a new perspective on what unity is. You know, we're always praying for unity as though it is something to go after. But God used him to open our eyes to the reality that unity is a person and that Christ has already, that prayer Jesus prayed has been answered. You know, that because we are now one body and we share his life and we're in him and he's in the Father, the unity that he prayed for has already been accomplished. The truth is we are already one 
And we don't need to become one. We simply need to be awakened to the reality that we are one and start to walk in that reality. Say to your brother, we're already one. You're already joined to me. I'm already joined to you. Sorry, Christ did it. And what God has joined together, no man is going to put asunder. So you just got to get used to spending time with me and living with me and putting up with me and all of that. And I got to just get used to putting up with you because whether you like it or not, in Christ we are. Thank you, Reverend Belong. Powerful, powerful, powerful. And then Friday night we had the parade of the nations and we saw the countries coming in. And wow, that was beautiful. And then we celebrated. And yesterday we had the food, the fun, the festival. If you weren't here, you just missed some good fun, good food, and good fellowship. But thank God there will be other anniversaries in Jesus' name. Say hallelujah. But I certainly want to thank God for all of those who work so hard behind the scenes in order to make it happen. May God bless you and reward your time and your effort to make it what it was. In Jesus' name. And so I guess officially today is that this morning we're supposed to be climaxing that. And uh, so I want to do that right now. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we get to celebrate Jesus this morning and all that he has done for us and through us over all these years. We know the, the, the best is yet to come and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you ever heard of the Great Commission? Could you put Matthew 28 verse 18 on the, on the, on the, on the screen, please? How many of you ever heard of the Great Commission? Raise your hand. Oh, Raise it high. Have you heard the Great Commission? Okay, it looks like maybe 25% of you have heard of the Great Commission. Either that or you just don't care to respond to bishops. So let me ask you one more time. And... Don't raise your hand now because you're supposed to. No. Just how many of you have ever heard of the third term, the Great Commission? It looks like still about 25%. So at Bethel World Outreach Ministers International, only 25%, maybe 30% of those who are here this morning have heard of the Great Commission. Wow, I just failed as a pastor. Seriously. Okay, I just failed as a pastor that at Bethel World Outreach Ministries, we have spoken so little of the Great Commission that only maybe 30% of you here today have ever heard of it. So we got to do a better job. Amen. The statistics show that only 17% of the body of Christ here in the U.S. have either heard or understand really what the Great Commission is. So maybe we're a little bit better, but we're certainly far from where we need to be. So the Great Commission has actually become the Great Omission. Did you hear me? The Great Commission has become, in many of our churches, the great omission. For some reason, we are omitting the kind of focus and emphasis that we should be placing on the Great Commission. We're focusing on a lot of other stuff. We're focusing on believers' breakthrough. We're focusing on believers' financial prosperity. We're focusing on believers getting, you know, finding that right person, that right man. We're focusing on a lot of things that are designed to feed and feed and feed those who are already fed. And we're omitting what Jesus gave us to do the, among the very last thing he said to the church and to his disciples. So I want to put all of us who already know in remembrance and I want to introduce to the rest of us this morning the Great Commission. Okay? 
So because this is so, so important, I want us to stand. Because I want us to read this with a sense of these are the marching orders that have come from the Lord of the church, for the church. For us collectively and for us individually, here are our marching orders. These were among the very last words Jesus spoke, certainly the last words in the Gospels. He spoke some things later in the book of Acts, but these were the last words recorded in the Gospels. And this is what he said. You know, last words are important, right? Amen. So really, when someone makes his last statement to a group of people, especially if he's their leader, those last words are critical and ought to become our priority. One of the first things we pay attention to should be the last things we heard our leader tell us to do. Right? So we want the great omission to become for us a great commission again. So let's read this. This is Jesus speaking together. And Jesus... Amen. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible just because it, it stresses some words and, and gives us some additional clarity. Jesus came up and said to them, all authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstances. And on every occasion, even to the end of the age. Thank you. You may be seated. So that is the marching orders. And, and when you read that and you listen to it, as we ought to really listen, we understand that Jesus has not left us, left the church on earth and us individual on earth to make a living. Yeah, we spend our time making a living. Jesus didn't leave us to make a living. He left us and assigned us the responsibility of making a difference. That was weak. Say to your neighbor, my friend, my brother, however you want to call him, just don't call him your enemy, but say to him. (laughs) Jesus left you on earth not to make a living but to make a difference. And the greatest difference you and I can make individually and as a church is the difference we make when we invest our time and our treasure to see souls saved and disciples made for Christ. There is absolutely nothing I can do or you can do that will make a greater difference for eternity than to be involved actively in the process of rescuing men from hell, delivering souls from eternal damnation, taking them out of the kingdom of darkness and bringing them into the kingdom of God, and changing their eternal destiny. There's no difference that we could make that is greater than living for the reason Jesus died. Oh, that was good. That came from heaven. Okay. There is no greater difference you can make 
than living for the reason Jesus died. Jesus died for souls. Now let's live to see souls saved. That's the Great Commission. Now when you read the text, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them, the primary command is make disciples. Make disciples. That's, that's, that's the primary command. Make disciples of all nations. Now, what is a disciple or who is a disciple? In short, a disciple is a devoted follower of Jesus Christ who is committed to doing all that Jesus has commanded. Say a disciple is a devoted disciple, excuse me, follower of Jesus who is committed to doing all that Jesus has commanded us to do. Amen? Now, how do you make disciples? You make disciples by going. Say going. going. Baptizing. Baptizing. Teaching. So the first step towards this making disciples is to make the decision that you're going to go. You're going to go where? To the nations. Say nations. That's why, thank God for Bethel, we take that seriously. And so we're celebrating this anniversary, but we thank God that we can, can literally say that as a result of our obedience to the degree that we have been obedient, today we are in 27 nations. Say hallelujah. And today, by the grace of God, we have more than 325 churches. We can do better. We can do much better. But I thank God that we've allowed him to use us enough that we are reaching the nations in that manner. 325 and counting churches, say amen. amen. 27 nations and counting, say amen. amen. That's the fruit that we're pointing to right now as we have endeavored by the grace of God to obey that commission. Can you imagine what can happen in the next 10 years if we, if we really, really got serious about this commission? and refuse to allow it to become omission. Hmm? If with the poor job we've done so far, in focusing on this, we can point to that, that tells you how much Jesus can do with little. You didn't hear me. That demonstrates how much Jesus can do with just a little commitment. Can you imagine what Jesus could do if all of us really got behind this mission and, and stopped living for, stop trying to make a living and start living to make a difference. So we're going to the nations, but, but not only when he says when he says go, that is not that's not a, a that's a participle. So the, the most literal way to translate that is as you are going, make disciples. Again, what he's really saying is this is not an option. This going piece, I, I'm I'm telling you to do it. I expect you to do it. Therefore, as you're doing it, you hear me? So he's saying, this is not an option for the church. It's not an option. As far as Jesus is concerned, this business of going is not an option. I have told you go. I'm sending you, so as you're going, that's what I expect. I don't expect you to be sitting. I don't expect you to be waiting for another word, for another vision, for another prophecy. I'm not expecting that. I've made it clear. I want you to go. 
I'm sending you. Now, as you're going, as you're obeying, say to the person, it's not an option. It cannot be an omission. This is a commission. This is not a great suggestion. This is a great commission. So listen, as you are going. Say to the person next to you, as you are going. One more time. As you. Now let's, let's make it collective because this commission is not just for individuals. When he spoke, he was speaking to the entire group. So let's say as we, Bethel World Outreach, we, this church, we, all of us together, as we together as one are going in obedience to the commission, this is what you are going to be doing, make disciples. Make devoted followers of Jesus who are committed to doing all that he has commanded us to do. Hallelujah. And as you go, what are you going to be telling them? You're going to be telling them the good news. We got good news. How beautiful on the mountains at the feet of those who bring good news. We are bearers of good news, people. Oh, you don't look like you have good news, but, 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 but we are, say so we are bearers of good news. I'm so glad that he hasn't sent us to bear bad news to people who, who need to hear good news. We come with good news. Amen. And the good news is called the gospel. The gospel of the grace of God. We don't come bringing law. We don't come bringing commandments. We don't come bringing judgment. We come proclaiming the good news that Jesus died so you can be justified. Jesus rose so you can be sanctified. Jesus Jesus is coming back so you can be glorified. Believe the gospel and be saved. Say, Jesus died so you can be justified. Jesus arose and lives so you can be sanctified. And Jesus is coming back so you can be glorified. Oh, sinner, believe the good news and be saved. Oh, let's say it one more time. Jesus died so you can be justified right in God's sight. Jesus lives in you so you can be sanctified. Jesus is coming again so you can be glorified. Oh, sinner, believe the gospel, the good news, and be saved. Now, if that's good news, let's show it. Let your face show it. Let your hands show it. Come on, raise your hand and thank God because you once were a sinner, but Jesus died and you are justified. Jesus lives and you are sanctified. Jesus is surely coming again and you will be glorified. Everybody say hallelujah. Wow. Now, Proclaim that gospel, and when they believe it, baptize them. Baptize them. What is baptism? Baptism is, is an initiation. It's, 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 it's established by Jesus so that all those who have believed in him can now make a public declaration of their faith in him and enact dramatically what the gospel they believe proclaims. So the gospel said Jesus died and was buried. But the gospel doesn't only say Jesus died and buried. The gospel says you died in him. In other words, the sinner in you <laughs> who loved to sin and who was under condemnation for sin was put to death on the cross in him. So he died, I died in him. He arose, I arose in him. He lives, I live in him. 
Paul summarized it, I am crucified with Christ and buried. Nevertheless, I live newness of life, yet not I, but it is Christ living inside of me. In the life, this new life of victory, you see me living over sin, over the devil, over the world, over the flesh. This new life you see me living, this is how I'm living it, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me. So in baptism, you are, you are enacting. Even as you're proclaiming your identification with Christ, you are preaching the gospel. Symbolically, you're dramatizing what the gospel proclaims and what you have experienced. And so right now, we're going to let you participate in a baptism because we're obeying the Great Commission. Amen. We have preached the gospel. They have believed. Come on, guys. Come on, get ready. Come on. Amen. We have preached the gospel. Somebody has witnessed to these people. They've heard this good news. They have believed it, and now they are going to get baptized. The great omission is becoming the great commission. Say the great omission is becoming the great Hallelujah. Praise him. Are you going to participate in this? Hallelujah. Let's make this a celebration. This is not a funeral. This is a resurrection. We are witnessing a resurrection. We are about to witness a resurrection in Jesus' name. Come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, brethren, this is why we're here. This is why we're called. Our mission is to win the loss at all costs and make as many disciples for Christ as we possibly can in our generation. Part of that disciple-making process is baptizing them. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for this morning. We have uh, seven candidates for baptism. And uh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to call them one by one and they can come up. Uh, we're going to start with Ivan Bilong. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ivan Bilon, have you given your life to Jesus Christ and accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yeah. <laughs> Say, yes, I have. Yes, I have. Have you made the decision to turn away from sinful life and to follow Jesus Christ for the rest of your life? Yes, I have. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, and upon the confession of your faith that he is your Lord and Savior, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. confess Jesus, haven't you? Yes, I have. On the confession of your faith that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You 
have confessed Jesus and by indication you are present here today to be baptized. Now we baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Because of the work of Jesus Christ, you are justified. Hallelujah. And because you are justified, you have been made right Amen. on the confession of your faith in Jesus. We now baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Emmanuel, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. Have you made the decision to turn away from your sinful life and to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes, I do. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ and upon the confession of your faith that he is your Lord and Savior, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Reginald, uh -huh. <laughs> have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, I had. <laughs> have you made the... <laughs> have you made the decision to turn away from any sinful life and follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes, I had. God. All right, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ and upon the confession of your faith that he is your Lord and Savior, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the, of the Holy Spirit. Hold your nose. Born, born, born again. Thank God I'm born again. Est-ce que tu as accepté le Seigneur Jésus-Christ comme ton Seigneur et Sauveur? Oui, je l'accepte. Amen. Est-ce que tu as pris la décision de te détourner du péché et de suivre Jésus-Christ pour le reste de ta vie? Oui, j'ai pris la décision. Amen. Sur autorité de notre Seigneur Jésus-Christ et par la confession de ta foi en lui comme étant ton Seigneur et Sauveur personnel, nous te baptisons maintenant au nom du Père, du Fils et du Saint-Esprit. Amen. 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 So go, as you go, not an option, preach the glorious good news, and then as they believe, baptize them. Amen? And in reenact the gospel. Christ died, I died. The old sinner is dead. 
Christ was buried, that old sinner is buried. And that same power, that same spirit that enabled Jesus to live a sinless life and brought him out of the grave is now at work in me and has also raised me up to newness of life and is enabling me every day to live victoriously over sin and over the flesh. Say hallelujah. Oh my goodness, my goodness. This is the Great Commission, that we, together, and each of us individually, have been commissioned to fulfill. It's not an option. Baptize them, but don't, don't just baptize them. They need teaching. So after they believe the gospel, and you baptize them, now it's your responsibility to do what? Teach them. Teach them what? To obey all things I've commanded them. Teach them to believe, because I commanded them to believe. Teach them to abide in me as their life. Teach them to receive the Father's love, and then to share the Father's love. Teach them to care for those who are lost. Teach them. Now, when we hear teach, what comes to our mind is sit them down in a classroom and give them information. But you got to understand what Jesus had in mind. Amen? Certainly, part of teaching them is giving them truth for their minds because their minds need to be renewed. Their spirits are brand new. The mind is still old. That old way of thinking needs to be replaced now with a new way of thinking that is anchored in the revelation of what Christ has done for them. Now they need to know who they are in Christ. They need to know that they have what he has and can do what he can do because he lives inside of them and is living through them. So now teach them to abide in him as their life. Teach them to receive the Father's love and then to be a channel of that love. Teach them to care for the lost and those who do not know him. But how do you teach? You give them truth to renew their minds. But discipleship or disciple making is not just aimed at changing the mind. It's aimed at developing a heart that is passionate for God and the things of God. And you cannot do that just by giving them information for the head. That's why when Jesus says teach, he's talking about not only giving information, but he's talking about you sharing your life and allowing them to see what the Christian life looks like in 2019. What does a Christian life look like when everything is going well? What does a Christian life look like when there's trouble? Because in this world you shall have tribulation. What does the Christian life look like when the enemy is attacking? What does a Christian look like when you've lost your job? What does a Christian life look like when a doctor tells you you're sick? What does a Christian life look like when your children are acting up? What does a Christian life look like when all is well and you're getting the promotion or when you don't get the promotion you really want it? Hmm? You let them see it even as you give information for the head. And that's why disciple making involves modeling for the new believer and mentoring the new believer, which means a willingness to literally spend time with those who are new in the faith until they have grown to the point where they truly understand in Jesus' name. So we're going to take just a few minutes. We don't have a lot of time, but I do want us to see this. We're going to take just a few minutes, and I want to show you what recently happened. It's just a little bit of what happened in Liberia when, when over 40 uh, of our people, members, many of them very youth, went on the mission field. Amen? Being 
being discipled and being disciplers. Could you show me very quickly? Sunday school classes are back here. We can meet in classroom. Sanctuary is in here. That's where I was. That's where we were before we came here. That's where we first started.
myself and letting God use me in every way and learning that it's really by the Spirit of God that we're able to do anything. But here is an example of disciples being made. They went to the mission field. They got to experience what it means to share the gospel cross-culturally. And they got to see that making disciples is not just about standing in the pulpit and teaching, but is relating to people where they are, building relationships and sharing the love of Christ with them. Now, one of the things that you saw there, you saw that, that scene where it was all dark, there were no lights, and they were praising God. They're learning that you can praise God whether everything is the way you want it, when there is electricity and air condition and comfort, but when you hit those times on your journey, because they were in a bus headed back, I believe, to their hotel, when the bus they were in, the tire, I believe, went bad, and they had to stop on the road where there were no lights. And instead of complaining, and say, I want to go back to America, where we always have lights, amen, and we're always comfortable. Look what they did. In the midst of that very disappointing, they begin to, oh my God, in everything, give thanks, amen. And so they're learning no matter what life brings, and sometimes the lights do go out, and the tire does go flat. One thing shouldn't go out and shouldn't go flat is your praise. Say hallelujah. So whether the tire is flat and the lights are out, my praise is still on. Come on, raise your hand and give God some praise. Say hallelujah. Glory be to God. Amen. So they're being discipled. They're being mentored even as they are being allowed to disciple and mentor others. Wow. That's the Great Commission being fulfilled. Now take that incident and multiply it a thousand times or two thousand times by each of us that is here. What if each of us decided that we're going to allow Christ to use us to make disciples? That we're not just going to come to church on Sunday morning and hear the word, get information, and then don't do anything with it. But as we get information or get truth our own minds will be renewed, and then we're going to go out there Monday through Sunday and actually put this to work, sharing the good news with the world. He says, go into all the world, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world, Montgomery County, Washington metropolitan area, United States, the nation, my family. My friends, my acquaintances, the stranger. Why do we actually stop living as though God has put us here to make a living and actually as a church and then as individuals begin to live as though God made us or left us here to make a difference? And, and as though we know the greater, greatest difference we can make is to be committed to the Great Commission. When we all embrace this, then truly Bethel will be a great church. <clears throat> and truly Jesus will be pleased with the work we're doing for him. And so I want to end with this charge. Please stand. <clears throat> As we celebrate 29 years, here is the charge. Bethel Bethel World Outreach Church, only Bethel World Outreach Ministers International, Bethel the Church, and Bethel, each member, hear this. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded 
you. Now look at me. That's the exhortation. That's the commission. Now here's the promise. Here's the promise. All authority and all power have been given to me. So the one who sends you is saying, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Remember who it is that is authorizing you to go. And when you're facing challenges, you're facing oppositions, you're tempted to be afraid, remember that the one who said, make disciples, is the one who also has all power and authority, which means he can handle it. Which means he's saying, don't look at yourself. As you go, keep looking at me. And then he concludes after saying, make disciples of all nations. Lo, behold, stop, consider, pay attention to this reality. I, the one with all authority and power, I'm not just sending you. I'm going with you. I'm going in you. I will be with you when you reach out to your family. I will be with you when you reach out to your friends. I will be with you when you reach out to your acquaintances. I will be with you when you reach out to your, the stranger. Remember me when you're tempted to be afraid. Remember me when you're tempted to lose hope. Remember me. I sent you. I'm with you. Take your eyes off of yourself as you fulfill the Great Commission. Keep your eyes on me, and if you will do that, I will empower you. I will empower you by my spirit on the inside of you. I will empower you. I will empower you. I will empower you. If you will take your eyes off of yourself and if you will place your eyes on him and keep your eyes on him and keep reminding yourself he's with you, he's in you, I will empower you to be my witnesses. Just last week, Tuesday, I was at, 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 at Cheesecake Factory, and, and we, were, we were with Dr. Sean Smith, his wife, Pastor and I, and I got to lead the waiter, a stranger, to the Lord. You see, you can fulfill the Great Commission everywhere. Going doesn't require that you cross the ocean. Going can begin today with your family with your friends, with your acquaintances, even with a stranger. Raise two hands to heaven and say, Lord, you have sent me. And my response is, I am going in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Amen. So this is why we've been here for 29 years to win the lost at all costs and make as many disciples for Christ. So, so this is what we're going to do. Next week, we're going to present to you an opportunity to get some training, all right, so that you can be more effective instruments in fulfilling the Great Commission. As you go, proclaiming the gospel and making disciples, we're going to present you with an opportunity here to get better trained and equipped so that you're even more effective as you go. How many of you will be willing to take advantage of that type of training? Just raise your hand high. Come on. Don't tell me this is all the response we're going to get. Would you be willing to get, a, get, get advantage of training if we provided it? Then please raise your hand. Don't, don't not raise your hand. I need to see. All right. Thank you. I wish everybody had raised their hand. I'm kind of disappointed that 
that more people didn't raise their hand. Um, I trust that those who didn't raise their hand are actually doing it. Because if you're not doing it, then you should raise your hand. Amen? But next week, we will provide you with opportunity to help equip you. Amen? To fulfill this commission. In Jesus' name. Amen. You glad you came today? Are you excited about, about this church? Amen. And what the future God has for us? Yeah, it's going to get gooder, guys. It's going to get better. In Jesus' name. We have, we have some cards here, and we're, you know, we're going to work on getting something better than this. But we want you, as you're going out, these cards are available. Get a few of them this week. Pass them out. Use them as opportunities to share the gospel with a stranger, with a family, the friends, the acquaintances you have. Amen. Now let's worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings.